Hello, and welcome to So How Are You Doing? The podcast focuses on the new reality we find ourselves in since the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic. Humans are inherently social creatures, which makes this a particularly trying time for us. As we social distance, self-isolate, and self-quarantine, this podcast aims to offer another way to connect with people, to hear and share what we're all going through together. My guest for this episode is Allie, a high school teacher in New York City. While she is now teaching remotely from her Manhattan school, she's also self-isolating in her 425-square-foot Brooklyn apartment. We'll discuss how she, her school, and her students have adapted to learning online, as well as her newly confined personal life. Hi, Ellie. Thanks for talking with me today. Sure. Thank you for having me. So, how are you doing? I'm doing okay, actually. I am in a good mood. I just went for a run. There was a break in the rain. We did some stretching and took a shower, and now I'm talking to you. So, currently I have endorphins, so I seem to be good. Well, that's good to hear. So, you're a teacher in New York City. Could you tell me about your school and your students? Sure. Um, I teach at a private international school on the Upper West Side. Um, and I teach grades nine and 10. So my kids are ages like 14 and 15, basically. And what's the general background of your students? Well, it's a, it's tricky. I mean, obviously it's Upper West Side and it's a private school. So they are coming from a higher socioeconomic background, uh, mostly, but I also, it is an international school. So there are there's a solid number. I really don't know off the top of my head, but maybe percentage wise, maybe 30% or a little bit bigger in the high school are actually coming from uh, living abroad. So sometimes their parents work at an embassy or they work for a multinational company and they've lived here for however long and maybe they've lived elsewhere beforehand. We also have a fair number of obviously kids that were born and raised in New York. We do have kids on scholarships as well but many of them are really quite well-traveled. Could you run me through your typical work routine, whether it's a day or a week, say two months ago, what was your normal school life like as a teacher? I usually take the train to work. So I live in Brooklyn and I teach in Manhattan. I would normally take the train about 40 minutes or so in the morning and have a nice time to read. And it's generally quiet because I'm going pretty early. I arrived at school um, around 7.30 or so in the morning and have a little bit of time to get set up for the day, check in with people in the shared office that I have with um, other history teachers. And then I think I used to teach for three periods in a row um, between ninth and 10th grade, then have a couple periods off for meetings and planning and grading and lunch, and then teach for another two periods and then have maybe meetings with students or with faculty before I came home. All right. Generally, it's being considered that March 11th is the beginning of the national response to the coronavirus pandemic. Looking back at the week of the 9th, how did things seem to you both in New York and at your school? Yeah, actually, that was that was definitely a big week for us because um, we my school had actually already been talking about the possibility of us needing to close and go online. Because it's an international school, we actually have campuses in four other countries. And so one of, there, two of them are in Asia, one is in Seoul and one is in Shanghai. And so those schools had already closed and had already, I think, been closed for probably a month or five weeks or so at that point. And obviously had been in communication with the administration of my school and sharing their information about you know, how they were teaching online and, and why. And then um, as things were quickly progressing, the week before March 11th, our school was already kind of talking with us, the faculty, about that possibility and about how they were were thinking about trying to respond. Our school um, actually had trainings early on for staff about how to use Google Meet and Google Classroom. Many people had already been doing that. And we were actually practicing with our students. So our students would get a little bit of preparation and could have some expectations going forward. 
then basically it happened really quickly. Um, we actually, we were in school on Monday, March 9th. And then that evening at like 10 30 PM, there was a message sent out that we were actually going to go online as of Tuesday, March 10th. And that was because the school had been informed that there was a, I think a parent or a family member in the community who had possibly come in contact with the virus. Um, and so they wanted to just basically head things off at the pass and close before anything got too serious. And it, it already looked that that was probably going to be happening with, uh, happening with other New York City schools as well. So we were a little bit earlier, which a lot of people I think were pretty grateful for. That's really interesting. You all seem to have been ahead of the curve here, having been in contact with your sister schools in Asia. Mm -hmm. For a lot of schools around the country, spring break lined up with the suspension of in-person classes. But it sounds like you were aware of the changes before then. How did you work out your shift to online classes? Well, one thing is that before our spring break, we were asked to teach asynchronously, meaning that we were asked to only just like post materials and post tasks for students to do. And then students would complete them kind of on whatever schedule and then submit the work and we would give feedback. And so there wasn't any expectation during that first week of like video conferencing or a following any kind of class schedule. But then the expectation was pretty clear that when we came back from spring break, which was, has now been two weeks ago, which was the week of, uh, I think the last week of March 28th or something. From then on, we would be synchronous. So that's what we're doing right now. The, the students follow a modified daily schedule. The expectation is that they video conference with the whole class and obviously the teacher at the beginning of each class and attendance is taken. And then the teachers may or may not use the full class time which is 40 minutes to either present information or lead discussions or look at resources or, you know, all manner of things that they would be doing in a class. And then there may or may not be homework um, and students kind of follow a schedule accordingly. There's also room in the schedule for like breaks. There's really extended breaks, like half an hour or 10 minutes. And there's an hour lunch. And the idea is that hopefully teachers are also doing like office hours and following up with kids individually too. I think that's interesting to hear how each school is dealing with remote teaching. Some schools are disseminating assignments while others are able to have interactive conferences. Uh -huh. Other teachers are recording lectures that students can view on their own schedule. Uh -huh. I don't know. It's just fascinating to see how it's being handled in different areas. Yeah, we, I mean, I, so my school is a kindergarten through grade 12 school. And so we have a really large variety of kind of how, how teachers are progressing with the curriculum. I mean, also grade 11 and 12 are in a diploma program for the IB. And so they have really serious curriculum requirements in terms of content. And so I think those are likely to be the teachers that are really pushing forward in like lectures and readings and those kinds of things. And then I have a little bit more freedom because I teach grades nine and 10. And I've actually not really modified my curriculum really very much. Um, not even really what I would be doing during class. class. It's kind of it's actually really exciting to what degree I'm able to kind of replicate what I would do in the classroom with what I'm doing online. So at their grade level, outside of classwork, is there any type of testing or benchmarks they need to hit? Kind of. Um, the, the school is an IB school, International Baccalaureate. So there, there are expectations in terms of, I guess, what you would call standards and then assessments that are not like worldwide or nationwide or statewide or anything, but they are connected to the MYP curriculum, which is like grades six through 10. So we don't have any kind of like exam that they need to do. The curriculum is pretty open as long as it's like guided by a certain criteria for assessment. Yeah. There's talk in the news about whether New York City schools are going to resume classes this year. It has just been a bit of a thing between Como and the Blasio. Has your school made a decision on that already, separate from the public schools? No, but everybody is basically, it seems to operate under the understanding that it's very likely we will not be coming back. Yeah. Has there been thought ahead to the next school year in the fall, or is that just too far out? Uh, I think people are really not ready to think about that. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how much of a decision on that you can really make at this point. What are your interactions like with your students? It sounds like you're able to talk to them all as a class. Do you have one-on-one -on -one time with them? 
my classes are not giant. They're like 14 to 18 kids or so. And so my teaching style is very discussion oriented anyway. And so I try to give a lot of opportunities for them to like basically react to material that we're studying or like chime in with opinions or something. And I use some online features where they can talk to each other in small groups and report back. And so that's been kind of fun. And the first week, especially I had office hours where they could just drop in and sort of see, you know, hey, how are you doing? And also are you, you know, let's talk about what you're working on in terms of class. And then lately I've been doing some individual check-ins just about like their progress on, on an assignment. But I haven't done a lot of like, how are you doing kind of thing? Because that seems to be done a lot by the deans at my school. They're doing a lot of like kind of emotional check-ins. Have you altered your expectations for academic performance from your students because of all that's going on in their worlds? Hmm. Or is it the same requirements as always? It's tricky. <laughs> I'm definitely thinking a lot about that. I just had a department meeting earlier um, this afternoon, and that was partly part of the discussion was, you know, are expectations too high? Should we be more considerate in terms of giving less homework and letting the students take more time to do things? I don't know. I'm kind of of two minds about it. Like I... For a while, I was really happy to move forward with content. And like, I really wanted to talk about something other than coronavirus. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and I feel like that probably the students to some extent are appreciative of that. It might be good for them to kind of get lost in the world of like 19th century imperialism in Africa um, <laughs> or whatever. I also want to be mindful of the fact that it's exhausting for them to be online the whole day. And also they're teenagers and they're living at home with their parents 24 seven. And like, they have very little control over their own lives right now. It's a very strange, I don't know. It sounds really frustrating. I think if I remember my own adolescence, I was barely at home and I just can't imagine being at home with my parents all the time. <laughs> So I, sh I, I'm, I'm growing a little bit in my empathy or remembering my empathy, maybe. <laughs> yeah. I'm kind of wondering whether I can be a little bit more, not, I wouldn't say lower expectations, but maybe like just be more mindful about some tasks and assessments and stuff. As they're learning from home, you're also teaching from home. Do you feel equipped on your end to be able to work and teach from your apartment? Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't use a lot of resources. I've been teaching for 15 years in three different continents and seven different schools. Um, so I created my own curriculum for grade nine and I, I have all the resources that I need already for grade 10. I actually have a lot of textbooks that I've like pilfered from schools over the years. There's a lot of things online that I use and share with colleagues, um, so in terms of like texts and things, I don't really need anything. And um, I have like kind of created a space that, I don't know, it's, it's interesting. I like shifted really quickly to like, okay, I'm going to work at this table and this is my workspace. And, you know, in between classes, I can use the couch, but not when I'm, not when I'm in class. You know, like I have lots of rules that I think are useful to me in terms of like being in the mindset of like, I am at school, even though I'm not at school, but I, that's really important to me. So... I think that's helped. You are listening to So How Are You Doing? Conversations about life in the COVID-19 era. If you haven't done so yet, please subscribe to this podcast on whatever player you're using and rate us over on iTunes. Thanks. Now, back to my interview with Ali in New York City. A question I'm asking everyone is how financially secure they feel. Do you feel secure with your teaching job? Yeah. Um, our, I mean, I teach at a private school and they, they're they actually um, very well managed financially. And they have assured us that like they are fine. You know, they're continuing to pay salaries. There's no expectation of anybody being let go, including like security and maintenance staff. You know, they're being very clear and explicit about retaining everybody and at the same level that they were at beforehand. And so I feel really confident in that. They've been really communicative and I'm a new faculty person there, but I feel like I'm in a really good position to keep going. So I, I'm not like fearful of that. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm a little bit concerned about the summer because I usually either travel or do some kind of summer 
kind of temporary fun job. And I have no idea what's going to happen for that. I w- was set to go on three different trips to five different countries this summer. Uh, and those were all canceled. So it's unclear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes, that sounds very disappointing. I also had travel plans for this year and now I'm like, when, when is it going to be possible this year, next year? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a big planner. I also, my 40th birthday is this July and I, that was a really big trip to plan. So unfortunately I think I'm going to just turn 40 next year instead. (laughs) Just like the Olympics, push it out a year. (laughs) So moving away from school, you work in Manhattan, but live in Brooklyn. Can you talk about what your social life was like two months ago? I would love to talk about my social life. (laughs) I miss it so much. I am a really social person. That's partly why I'm living in New York. I'm kind of known amongst my friends as being like the one who always invites people to things, usually cultural things. So Normally, uh, even on weekdays, you know, I'd be going to like concerts and dance performances and plays and I don't know, like out to dinner with friends and to some kind of cocktail hour and some strange immersive art event or a museum or something like that. And I was hosting dinner parties every month. Yeah. So I had a pretty active social life in summary. So you're socially isolating now? Yes, I live alone I do have one friend that lives a block away. And so it's been really awesome to be able, we still see each other at a distance, but she also works from home and lives alone. And we've been seeing each other for, you know, every few days for the last month. So we kind of know each other's level of risk and safety and awareness and feel like we're, we're still being responsible, but that's the only person that I've seen other like and interacted with socially other than like my landlord who lives in the building. That's about it. Mm-hmm. So what's your apartment like? It's 425 square feet. It's the smallest place I've ever lived in. <laughs> <laughs> but it's really lovely. I really like it. And I think I love it even more now, which is good because I spent a lot of time here. It's a brownstone. It's really beautiful. It's in a historic neighborhood in Brooklyn near Prospect Park, which has also been a very huge part of my sanity in the last month. Um, It has bay windows and a view of other brownstones and it gets a lot of light. Yeah, it's really been great, actually. So you're generally very social. How have you been communicating with people during this time, besides for your one friend blocks away? Well, actually, I've I've actually kept up with the cultural things that I would have been doing. I like right after the, um, my school went online, then it was my spring break and I would have been traveling, but I obviously wasn't going to do that. And so I kind of turned my energy to like finding ways to engage with the cultural and social things that I probably would have done in real life, but online. So I actually found a lot of great options and I've been doing a lot of that. So, and inviting friends. So like I've done a lot of concerts, like live streamed concerts that are mostly classical music that previously were were from this organization that was hosted in living rooms. And so that's kind of sweet. And then I've done like a puppet show and a vintage cartoon film experience and a storytelling show a couple times, a couple dance parties. (laughs) I did punk rock aerobics. And so generally I like will find these and then like invite the people that I think will would want to do them. And then we'll have like a back channel chat during it which is basically like the equivalent of like whispering in your friend's ear during the theater performance. Only now I don't get in trouble, so I kind of like it. (laughs) Yeah, being alone for this extended period and realizing it's going to go on for a while still, there's got to be ways of dealing with that and bring it back in a normal life. Are there other ways you're dealing with the stress and anxiety of the situation? I mean, I actually am kind of grateful for the fact that I was living abroad for the last six years because I was already really in the habit of being in touch with people that I care about. So I already um, was kind of in the practice of like using, I use WhatsApp for um, audio messages. And so I, I actually do this with my friend, Sarah. 
I would leave, you know, like a five minute audio message as I was walking to the train, like, here's what's going on with me. I've been thinking about this. This is a great book that I read. You know, I wonder about this about you. And then she would leave me one back. And so I've been doing that still with, with friends and also of course having video chats. I host, you know, I've been doing these sort of like happy hour reunions with people I used to work with that are now kind of spread across the globe. And then I, I became the de facto person to host those for my current school, which has been kind of fun. So you're in contact with people, not just around the country, but around the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How are your friends in other areas seeming to be dealing with it? I guess you must know people who are ahead and behind the virus. Yeah. Compared to us in the U.S. Yeah, I did. I did have several friends that were teaching in Hong Kong and China and they, the, all the ones I think that were teaching in China have now gone home to either Canada or the U S and the guy in um, Hong Kong is still there. And he seems to think like things are basically over and fine. I'm not really sure if that's true. Um, <laughs> my friends in Ethiopia and Ghana, the ones in Ethiopia have left and gone to Canada. The ones in Ghana have stayed put and they're kind of worried about that. And then the ones in Argentina are like stuck there. There are no flights, um, but they seem to be well. And also that, that government has shut things down much more authoritatively than the government here. So it's interesting to talk about. Yeah. So it's, it's also just interesting to compare, like I teach history and politics and psychology. So there's been a lot of conversations about like how we should be responding and how we are responding and how, you know, governments are taking care and how they're not taking care. and comparing those experiences. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. This is one time where you're like, there are benefits of an authoritarian government. <laughs> yeah, <actually. laughs> Just with this. Right. That's definitely been one of the discussions, actually. It's been really interesting to, to talk about that. Yeah. Trade-offs. <laughs> How is your family doing? Are you in contact with your folks and your siblings? Yeah. Um, actually, what's funny is that I... I generally wasn't in the habit of being very much in touch with my dad. Um, I'm not super close with my dad and haven't lived in the same state as him for like, you know, 20 years or something. My mom passed away a couple of years ago, but my dad and my stepmom and my sister, who I am very much in touch with, have decided to have weekly wine tastings. Um, <laughs> Because that seemed like the thing that would get them online. And so we've actually been so much more in touch than we have been in years. And it's been really fun. And um, recently, this was kind of amusing. My dad sent my sister and I both packages and made us wait to open them until Easter Sunday. We're not at all religious. And we opened them on camera and they were Easter baskets full of like toys and candy, even though we're both in our 40s. So... That was actually like very, very sweet. So they're doing fine. <laughs> Short story. <laughs> That's good to hear. I actually died Easter eggs yesterday, even though I don't have any children. <laughs> but That's, great. That's still fine. <laughs> Being outside of New York City, which sounds like an epicenter of the outbreak, what is it like going out in public? How much are you going out? What is it like going shopping? How are you handling your basic needs there? Right. I think I'm pretty good at like cooking for myself and being self-sufficient. Uh, again, I think, you know, I've had to do that for the last six years outside of the U S and so I've gotten pretty good at stocking up kind of, and like having things that I'm comfortable with cooking that are kind of basic. So I have only, I've limited myself to only grocery shopping every two weeks and I seem to do pretty well, although I have ordered pizza and like take out a few times so I can still do that. I still like, you know, I, it's, it's very surreal. Like it's much, much more quiet and calm than it normally has been living here. That sounds kind of awful because people are obviously seeing in the news how terrible things are in New York. And so I think the main, the main adjective I would use is surreal just because walking around in my neighborhood, it's actually kind of lovely, you know, that it's spring and the trees are flowering and kids are playing on their stoops and people are walking their dogs. And it just seems like a quiet, day. And yet you can hear sirens in the distance much, much, much more often than you would normally. And, you know, I know that only probably a mile or two away, somebody's having a horrible experience in a hospital, either healthcare workers or somebody struggling. So it's just 
tricky to kind of remember that. And of course, I want to remember that. There has been the, the 7 p.m. clapping. I don't know if that's happening like in other cities. Yeah, I'm aware it's happening other places. <laughs> so so my, my neighborhood is very in on this. Um, and my I, we have a, a really large church at the end of my block. And so the, that is kind of the kickoff because it sounds the, the time. And then it's this wonderful, actually, if I don't think I'll still be on the phone with you, but it'll happen in 15 minutes. Um, so I can hold out the microphone and you could hear it, but it's like really, really lovely because the neighborhood that I live in is like very kind of proactive and really into, I, I don't know, this show of solidarity, I guess. And so people lean out of their windows and they're clapping and hooting and hollering and banging on pots and pans. And somebody just keeps shouting, thank you. Thank you. Over and over, you know, it kind of like makes me want to cry every day, but I think it's great too. That sounds amazing. So as you're there, are you concerned personally about getting the virus? No, but mostly because I think I'm, I tend to be like a pretty optimistic person and maybe like willfully ignorant. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not that willfully ignorant, but um, I, I just don't think, I think I'm taking the appropriate precautions and I don't really see how I could sustainably and positively live doing anything more extreme. You know, like I already, spend every hour alone, except when I like go for a walk or run in the park. And when I go for a walk or run in the park, then I am at a distance and I'm not seeing anybody. So I just, I, I generally try to not be an anxious person. And so, you know, I try to not overread the news and be careful about kind of how much I'm, I'm dwelling in kind of what's going on. Do you know anyone that's contracted COVID-19? I have one good friend that thinks that she did and she could not get tested, uh, which was kind of hard to hear. Um, she's now better. She had been already socially isolated for like, I don't know, a week or 10 days by the point that she was told that she had probably come in contact with somebody that tested positive. And then she started feeling sick and it was pretty bad for a number of days. And we were trying to check in with her, obviously just like over, you know, messaging. Mm -hmm. um, see if we could do anything, but, but she wasn't able to get tested. And so she just basically received some medicine and took care. And then thank goodness she got better, but that was pretty weird for a time. And also startling to have it happen to some, somebody that I knew pretty well. And, you know, is relatively healthy in my age. Sadly, not being able to get tested seems fairly common until you're at a point where you have to be admitted to a hospital. Right. Is there anything else I should have asked or something interesting that's occurred to you? One thing that's been interesting, I guess, that I've been thinking about is like what this reminds me of, I guess. And especially when I was like on my spring break, so I wasn't working, although I was not in any danger of losing my job. Um, I knew I would be working again soon. I was thinking that like at times it kind of reminded me of okay, maybe this is like life a hundred years ago. Like we have to stay with our family. We have to take care of each other. We generally don't see people that are not from a, like our immediate vicinity or immediate neighborhood. Um, you know, my friend that, that I am close with, she's has like an infant and a toddler and she moved home so that her parents could help her care for them. And she also has her husband. And so they have like three generations in one home and they're not really seeing anybody else and they eat dinner together every day. And I was just like, oh, this is kind of like Little House on the Prairie. And everybody's learning how to knit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and tonight we'll all gather around the Victrola. Um, <laughs> but I, it's kind of like interesting to think about the historical sort of reverberations, not just in terms of pandemics, but also in terms of like, how do you spend your time and, and what's important and how do you use this time to sort of maintain routines, but maybe also change your routines and, and kind of reconsider the way that you do things. That's a good perspective on all of this. I think this is definitely going to change most people's worldview. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hope so. I think so. Well, Ali, thanks for talking with me. I appreciate it. It's good to hear from you as a teacher and someone living in New York. 
I wish you and your fellow teachers all the best. We'll talk again soon. Great. Thank you. Thanks for chatting. Thanks for listening to this episode. Please stay tuned for future interviews of more guests. I'll be speaking with Allie again to see how she's coping in New York City with our new reality. I'm your host, Josh Elliott, and this has been So How Are You Doing? If you can, please subscribe and rate this program over on iTunes. I'm going to end this episode with the sound of Alley Street in Brooklyn applauding in solidarity with all the frontline workers of this pandemic and each other. Stay safe, everyone.